we're going to transition from conversion marketing or to, to improving your conversion rate to talking about the structure of your marketing organization itself. Um, so David Mausoff, um, he uh, recently joined 20th Century Fox as their VP of User Acquisition and Marketing. But before that, he was the uh, head of acquisition strategy at Lyft. And he's going to talk about one of the biggest challenges that founders and executives face, which is how to scale your organization from being a seed Series A style company where you might only have one or two marketing hires to a full-fledged organization um, that might have dozens and dozens of, of marketing hires and acquisition hires. So give it up for David. Cool. So before we get started, I uh, wanted to just tell you a quick anecdote I had with a founder about nine months ago. So I had just left Lyft, and I was talking to different companies, talking about some of their problems. And uh, this one guy, who I actually respect a lot, uses product all the time, told me, you know, hey, we just hired this CMO. Uh, she's very well respected. Uh, she just spent a significant amount of money on this TV campaign. Uh, there's absolutely no results in the city specific campaign that we ran, and uh, we need to like, let her go, and I don't know what to do next. So should we hire a VP of performance marketing, a VP of brand marketing? Uh, do I just need to hire a product manager to run like all our marketing? What's, what's the right strategy? And I've talked to like 20 people, and like no one has a good point of view on this. And so then I talked to this person, and then literally two weeks later, I had this exact same conversation. And I probably had this conversation about six to seven times over the next like six months with different people. And I started thinking, why is this conversation coming up over and over again with different people who arguably are doing very well for themselves in terms of designing their companies? And I think part of the reason is today, if you go to do searching in terms of like growth, designing marketing, there's a lot of tactics, such as how to rank number one for Google, how to grow hack your way to success, how to improve your conversion rate, things like that. But fundamentally, if you're operating a team, you're trying to figure out who are the right people on your team that can actually handle the day-to-day, -day, the week-to-week, -week, and the planning, and do it in a way that you can focus on other things in terms of your company. And so what we'll try to talk about today is more about the strategy side and how do you actually design your organization for 2018, and what are some mistakes that I'm seeing some companies make um, in terms of how they're structuring their team today. Cool. So a quick background myself. Uh, so I ran growth marketing at Lyft for about four years, um, small company called Lyft, and they seemed like they did okay. Um, probably spent more money than uh, I care to admit, but spent about a half billion dollars over the past 10 years. Um, worked in a variety of industries, so I've seen everything from mobile to desktop to travel to transportation and it's kind of seen small companies all the way up to public companies. So got them pretty good wide spectrum in terms of uh, companies and the challenges that they're facing. So the framework for the meeting today is we'll talk through how to think about your growth framework. Um, this will probably be the lightest weight part of it. Uh, you can go into very uh, deep depth in terms of how to structure your business, how to look at the framework, but where we'll spend the majority of the time is in terms of your growth leader type, how to actually structure your team, um, what are some of the things that are changing between uh, 2013 and 2018 in terms of the overall marketplace, and then how do you actually set up your team then to actually grow with your business as well too. Cool. So for anyone who's seen uh, Uber or Lyft slides, this is probably not uh, the newest, newest thing, but the way that essentially we looked at growth in terms of Lyft was as we essentially added more drivers onto the platform, that basically produced lower ETAs for us as a company. And so the reason why ETAs were so important is what we essentially looked at is as your sessions essentially um, were growing, as you improved your ETA, you actually saw an increase in conversion rates. So going from seven minutes to five minutes to three minutes actually produced a higher conversion rate for your um, basically passenger sessions. From that, essentially, that generated more rides, which then actually increased uh, utilization rates, which then produced higher pay for the drivers. And then pay was actually directly correlated to the driver retention rates and the driver hours on the platform. And so 
the way that we essentially structured the team from the start was focused in terms of how do we get more drivers on the platform, and then how do we also get more passengers on the platform as well, too. So we actually created two different teams that are kind of focused on each one of those areas, passenger and driver acquisition. Um, we also had a component in terms of retention, but retention was less important for us as a business. And so you guys obviously know your business better than others, but for most of you, you're going to have one goal that you're going to be focused on. If you're a marketplace business, you'll probably have two sides, potentially a provider side and also a demand side as well, too. So this will become more important as we kind of talk through some of the future sections, but have this in mind as we kind of go further into the presentation. So this is a, a slightly changed job description that I saw from a company that I was consulting with recently. So uh, they came to me and they said, hey, you know, we're only looking for someone with 15 years of industry experience. Um, they need to have managed $100 million in spending. They need to understand everything from product management to engineering. They need to have a computer science degree. Um, they need to be based in San Francisco. And they need to build a work of all our executives. So for any of the recruiters in the room, this is also called a unicorn. Um, so it doesn't actually exist. And if you do find this person, please capture that person and send them to me so I can actually meet this person. Um, but I feel like I've met everyone in San Francisco at this point and I have not met this person. And so part of the issue is, it kind of comes down to this anecdote about, are you a duck farmer or a chicken farmer? How many people here know about this anecdote, the duck farmer, chicken farmer? Okay, so the way it essentially goes is there's this guy who's basically running a farm and he's like, you know what? I'm gonna become the best chicken farmer out there. And so what he does is he builds his fence, builds a chicken coop, and he puts the chickens in there. And then the next day, he comes and he checks it out, and what happens? There's a bunch of ducks in it. And he's like, you know what? This time, I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna like, build a bigger fence, get a big, big, better like, uh, place for them to stay in, and I'm gonna have a proper chicken farm. So he builds a bigger fence, sets it up. Two days later, he comes back, and what's there? Ducks. And then he does this again and again, and every single time, the ducks keep coming back in. And so finally, he's frustrated, and this guy walks by, and he says, dude, you're a duck farmer, not a chicken farmer. And so the reason why this is important is you need to think about your business and not what your competitors or what your other industries are doing. So essentially, if you're a social media company or you're an on-demand delivery company, you need different things in terms of the leaders that you're hiring for. So if you're, for example, Grubhub, for example, you're gonna be spending a lot more money on things like TV, Facebook advertising, Google advertising, because your users actually have a higher LTV to them. If you're a social media application, you should not be over-indexing on trying to hire someone who has paid acquisition experience. You're gonna be focusing a lot more on your onboarding and your retention, which is more free stuff. And so you need someone who's gonna have potentially a higher product acquisition and also product management experience sets. And so this is important because I've actually talked to some people where they say, literally in this case, I'm not gonna say the two, two companies, but an on-demand delivery company was talking to the social media company, and the social media company is saying, hey, you know, we built this great, uh, built great growth team. It's been working really well in terms of increasing our DAU. And the on-demand company says, great, that's exactly who we need to hire for. We need to hire someone who's a product management expert, who's a former engineer, and that needs to be our like, head of growth. And so then they hire him, and then 30 days in, they're like, wait, why is our VP of growth knowing nothing about marketing and doesn't know how to actually like, do creative designs or marketing mixed modeling? And it's because they hired for the wrong person to start rather than actually thinking about who was the right person and the right skill sets that they were looking for. So there's no one single type of growth leader that you actually need to hire for your company. It's really based on where you actually fit with the marketplace. This is kind of another issue that I'm seeing as well too, is there's kind of this classic dilemma, I think in terms of silos, where you kind of have a classic core engineering and also throwing in your growth engineering team all within one engineering org, your separated marketing org, and sometimes now you've been seeing there's a brand marketing org, there's a performance marketing org, um, you have your own product org, and analytics org. And so the end result that you end up seeing is your product manager or your VP of product comes to you and says, hey, you know, the reason our product is failing is because marketing isn't sending enough traffic to us. Your CMO is saying 
they couldn't measure the TV campaign properly because the analytics team just wasn't uh, helping them get it set up initially. And it goes on and on. And so part of this is uh, how do you actually structure your team from the start in a way to actually solve for some of these issues. And most of them in a lot of cases actually are avoidable. So this is a simple way, but how we essentially structure it at Fox Next, but we actually have an acquisition team, an onboarding, referral, and then also life cycle team. And then within each one of our functional pods, we essentially have, and this is not every single pod, but we essentially have a data scientist, we have an engineer, designer, uh, program manager in some cases that are actually working together on different projects. So for example, one of the guys that we have who's running acquisition um, actually is a former engineer who then turned marketer, who knows both sides of it, and who can talk to our other engineers. We have a data scientist who had no experience in terms of marketing, but the acquisition lead taught her everything about that. And then we have other people who are focused on each individual thing. And so they meet every week, um, they plan out their sprints, and they end up working very efficiently overall. And so we've created these different pods to essentially be autonomous to each other, but all fit within under the growth organization. And I think what's important too is for the engineers, we actually have a separate engineering organization that's separate from the core engineering team. And so even though we work really closely with our CTO, it basically allows us to have our own planning, do our own research planning, and actually, in a lot of cases, move faster than if you basically siloed everything into its own pod. So moving into growth tactics, um, I think another issue I've seen is not really understanding where people actually fit within the marketplace. And so the best way to think about this is if you're WhatsApp and your user LTV is $2 or your machine zone and your user LTV is $200, your marketing mix is gonna change very drastically based on that. And essentially, this also goes back to who you're looking to hire for. And so oftentimes you'll see something, I've seen companies that say, well, WhatsApp did all these hacks in terms of their conversion optimization. We should be spending all our time trying to do that where they could actually be getting a lot more value focusing on the paid acquisition side or on the lifecycle marketing side instead. And so, you know, a way to think about this is imagine that these are all the different tactics that you can basically go against. So on the x-axis, you have basically the relative difficulty in terms of optimizing these channels. So from low to high. On the y-axis, you have essentially the cost it is to acquire a user. So think about it from low cost to high cost. And then the bubble is basically representing the relative size of the channels today. And so what you're kind of seeing happening in the marketplace is some of the traditional channels like TV and affiliate are becoming smaller over time. And also some of the traditional um, online media channels like Twitter, Facebook, Google um, are actually becoming more expensive and actually more difficult um, to compete in the marketplace today. So five years ago, you could go on Facebook and you get a dollar CPI and that'd be fine. If you wanna go get a dollar CPI today and anyone promises you that, you should probably go fire them right away. Um, so oftentimes I'm hearing a lot of people quote these numbers about what's possible based on things that happened five or seven years ago. But the marketplace in general has changed drastically from 2013 or 2011 in terms of the level of sophistication it takes to actually do well these channels. Um, and so if you're gonna go, if you have limited resources as a company, you can't go focus on every single one of these channels. You have to figure out which ones are actually gonna be best for your business model and hyper-focus on them. So for example, for Machine Zone, they hyper-focused on Facebook and at the end of it, I think they were spending about a million dollars a day on Facebook advertising because every single day they had their entire team built around that. Something like WhatsApp is going to be much more focused in terms of the lower right quadrant because they can't go spend you know, that much money on TV ads or on Facebook ads. And if you're someone like Uber, for example, you're going to be probably somewhere in the middle because your used LTV is kind of in the middle zone. So one of the ways that we set up the team at uh, Lyft back in 2013 is we had this massive team that was basically built out by each channel. So you had a social lead, search lead, display lead, and you ended up having this very highly segmented organization. Um, and there was also a lot of manual processes that were essentially built out. And so it worked really well in terms of allowing us to scale very rapidly as an organization, 
But the problem is it became very inefficient as we got to scale to quickly make decisions. And it, for anyone who's actually managed large organizations, you know it's the more people that you're essentially hiring, the more problems that essentially you're running into. And so if you can keep a team lean from the start, it's actually much more efficient and easier to pay them more money. And so one of the biggest moves I'm seeing is actually the movement to actually much smaller teams versus then rather large teams. And so this is actually the way that we have it. This is one of the ways we actually have the team set up at Fox is we actually have a more sophisticated analytics org that is more data scientist and BI oriented. And then we have a growth engine org, which is mainly SWEs, TPMs, and then we also have a front end guy. And then a much more consolidated growth marketing function. But each one of those people have basically a much wider scope. And so not, not going to actually go share actual budget, but you can imagine uh, probably over $100 million that these people are essentially managing in a much more compact form. And so five years ago, this would not have been possible because there was a lot of things that weren't out there in the marketplace today. So specifically, one of the things that's been the biggest unlocks for us has been the increase in automation tools. Uh, by the way, I didn't put Segment on here because they're a sponsor, but they're a great tool. You guys should use them. Um, but all these, all these things have actually made our lives much easier. So there's simpler marketing APIs from partners like Facebook, Google, other partners. There's better reporting tools like Looker, Tableau. There's better spend automation systems to actually get the spend data into your databases. And each one of these things that have been basically getting built out has been one thing that our engineering team doesn't have to go build internally. And so you can outsource a lot of your non-core capabilities to third parties, which then basically allows you to have a smaller team and then also less manual things that you're essentially doing. And so when we actually designed the organization from the start, we basically incorporated almost every one of these uh, tools from the very scratch. And so it allows us to have very clean data sets and actually have all these systems in place to basically automate these processes. And so the, that allows us then to have a much smaller team. And then each person on the team has a much higher impact focusing on actual value add work, essentially. So, uh, a good analogy I heard from a friend is like if you go to, if you went back to the stock trading industry back in like 2000, there wasn't nearly as much automation. Now a stock trader essentially is spending more time looking at the systems and making sure the system is actually making the right decisions. And a lot of the day-to-day -day processes are automated. Here's an example of how we actually have a part of the stack built for the, any of the engineers. Sorry if I missed, messed anything up but we actually have a centralized UI that every media buyer essentially logs into every single day, and all their tools are in there. They don't basically spend any time at all in any third-party UIs. The other thing we have as well, too, is all the spending is automated. So whether it's the CFO of Fox, whether it's the analyst, everyone with the organization can see every, all the performance data. So sometimes I literally get a message from our CFO who's on beach, and he can actually go check the performance data and the ROI of all our campaigns real time. And so that's part of the beauty of having these systems in place now is we can actually automate a lot of things that are still being done in Google spreadsheets or Google documents or things like that right now. The other thing that's been really changing is in terms of how do you make um, marketing decisions in terms of spend allocation. So historically, you would have a marketer basically say, I'm going to spend $10,000 on this campaign or I'm going to bid this much for audience. Um, the biggest change is you don't really, in, in general, I think marketers probably should not be making spending decisions at this point in 2018. So today we actually don't let the marketers actually make spending decisions. We actually give the data scientists the full power to make the spending decisions. And so you could actually imagine if you're getting all the bid and budget data as well as your marginal costs for your investments, you can then plot out what the relationship is as you increase your budget or as you increase your bid and what your marginal dollar value is. And so if you have, let's say, a thousand of these curves that are being updated every day, there's no way a marketer can figure out what the marginal value and what's the right investment to be making for each one of those, and then at the same time having to be improving the model. And so in a lot of cases, you're asking a marketer to do an impossible task that a machine could actually do much better. And so this is actually what we're doing today. And it's actually been working incredibly effective for us in terms of actually making better media mix modeling decisions real time. And it's very explainable because you go talk to the CFO and you say, well, the marginal investment 
is actually going to lose, lose us $2. Do you still want to go make that marginal investment decision? And most CFOs who are rational will say, no, let's not make, go make that decision. And we actually have the data, and we can explain the model logic in a way that makes sense to them. And so I think forcing yourself to actually have to do these types of modeling problems that marketers having to kind of do in their head right now will allow you to be much more sophisticated. Uh, two other things before I get kicked off stage. Um, the other two things that are changing is before you used to have essentially a thousand different campaigns that had different bid targets, different RI targets. Um, and the big difference now is you can actually have a much more simplified structure where you basically have one campaign, have 20,000 creatives running in that cr campaign, but actually sending the bidder a predictive LTV signal um, that then allows you to basically optimize much earlier in the funnel, um, basically who it should be essentially targeting. So for today, for example, we basically have one campaign that runs across the entire worldwide, and we have basically 100 different ads in 100 different languages that are running to different people. So we have a Turkish ad, an Iranian ad, sorry, Persian, Persian <laughs> ad, sorry if I got that wrong. Um, and that basically allows us to simplify decisions, and then we basically send an early in-game event that allows us to quickly decide who we should be bidding against and allows them to basically better score the users. So let's put it all together. Uh, obviously, can't cover everything in 15 minutes, but I think in general, what I would say is thinking about who your growth leader type is based on your business needs, thinking about your growth tactics in terms of where you actually fit within the actual ecosystem today. And I think lastly, how do you actually Think about setting up your team to use some of the automation tools that are out there today. And then how can you remove some of the day-to-day -day tasks that your marketers are having to do right now and actually give them to your technical teams to actually make those decisions oftentimes much better than your marketers can do. So hopefully it's useful. And let me know if you have any questions. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.